Thanks, Simon. John slurred through his nine pint and five shot stupor, just sober enough to be grateful to the man who had somehow got him home from where he'd been and up the stairs and onto his bed, and who he would discover the following day had even removed his shoes for him. Except that the man who helped him wasn't Simon, or even Simon, it was me. And it wasn't an accident that it was me. I'd been anticipating this moment, or one like it, for a couple of years now. Maybe it was having that year off after school that gave me the space to think about what kind of life I wanted to lead when I went on to uni. Maybe it was the fact that my mum had constantly gone to work asking herself, how am I serving God here today? Maybe it was the experience of driving a camper van with three of my best mates through what turned out to be a Serbian minefield that that concentrated my mind on the true purpose of life. Whatever it was in that gap year before uni, I asked myself the question, is uni right for me or just what I do next? Because that's what people with decent A-levels do next. And I didn't just ask myself the question, I asked God too. And I'm sure, no, convinced, that God gave me an answer, a passage from Ezekiel. I have a purpose for you this next season. This uni is a valley of dry bones, physically alive, but spiritually dead. And I want you to call them back to life. And that led me to think very hard about how I was going to live from that day on. I quickly figured out some of the more obvious things You didn't want to be in the maelstrom of Freshers Week, five pints in, with Rihanna pumping through the speakers and an increasingly attractive woman swaying in your arms before you ask yourself the question, how do I want to live? I saw it coming and planned for it. And I kept asking the questions. What would it look like if Jesus lived in this Hall of Residence? What would it look like if Jesus was in this seminar, in this team playing midfield? And so when I signed up for a second year house with six others, before most of them knew each other's surnames, I'd asked myself the question, what would it look like if Jesus were living in this house? I'd thought about the ways I might serve my future housemates and where my boundaries would be. Yes, willing to clear up after others sometimes, but definitely not 70 times seven times. I'd anticipated the consequences of the uni's drinking culture, deciding that I would be the one who would stay on till the small hours after the jokes had long since ceased to be funny, to make sure everyone got home. And the reality was that, over the year, I had helped every one of my six housemates, male and female, get safely home. In the first term in the house there were all sorts of medical issues, In one week alone, we had an ambulance three times for three different people. At the end of that term, I was the last to leave, and I decided to prayer walk the house, praying in the communal rooms for joy and for friendships and care for one another, praying at the door of each housemate's room for protection, for their health, for their progress in their studies and for their salvation. The following term, there were no trips to hospital, no ambulances, not even a doctor. And time passed and midway through my third year, I got a text from Becca. She'd been a housemate in second year and we'd formed a good friendship. She was concerned about gender equality and and I was into social justice, anti-slavery, anti-human trafficking. We'd had stuff in common and we talked about my following Jesus and its connection to my commitment to the poor and the marginalised. When are you back? Becca asked. And when we met up, she wanted to know why I was still a Christian and why I gave my life to it. For me, it felt like that moment in Acts when the Ethiopian eunuch invited Philip to explain who Isaiah was referring to in the passage. You don't get a much clearer opening to share your faith than that. So I took it. And I told her all about who Jesus is and what he's done for me, what he means to me. (laughs) Becca's coming to faith was nearly as swift as the eunuchs. 
she wasn't baptised in the bath that evening. But a few months later, after several conversations, a couple of visits to church, some times of prayer with me and some female students, and a long holiday conversation with her grandma, Rachel, my girlfriend, led Becca to faith in Christ. It happened on the fourth evening of an Alpha course. I was away, but my not being there made it seem even more of a gift from God. He was reassuring me that whatever he called me to do, the results would not be up to me. <laughs> they never are. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God. He who makes things grow.